Good morning everyone. Welcome to Science Vines. You are looking at the audio chapters of class 11th biology. This is chapter 17 breathing and exchange of gases of the unit 5 human physiology. So let's start with this chapter. As you have read earlier oxygen is utilized by the organisms to indirectly break down simple molecules like glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, etc. to derive energy to perform various activities. Carbon dioxide, which is harmful, is also released during the above catabolic reactions. It is therefore evident that O2 has to be continuously provided to the cells and CO2 produced by the cells have to be released out. This process of exchange of O2 from the atmosphere with the CO2 produced by the cells is called breathing, commonly known as respiration. Place your hands on your chest. You can feel the chest moving up and down. You know that is due to breathing. How do we breathe? The respiratory organs and the mechanisms of breathing are described in the following sections of this chapter. Respiratory organs. Mechanisms of breathing vary among different groups of animals, depending mainly on their habitats and level of organization. Lower invertebrates like sponges, cylindrates, flatworms, etc. exchange O2 with CO2 by simple diffusion over their entire body surface. Earthworms use their moist cuticle and Insects have a network of tubes or tracheal tubes to transport atmospheric air within the body. Special vascularized structures called gills, bronchial respiration, are used by most of the aquatic arthropods and mollusks, whereas vascularized bags called lungs or perm pulmonary respiration are used by the terrestrial forms for the exchange of gases. Among vertebrates, fishes use gills, whereas amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals respire through lungs. Amphibians like frogs can respire through their moist skin. Cutaneous respiration human respiratory system we have a pair of external nostrils opening out above the upper lips it leads to a nasal chamber through the nasal passage the nasal chamber opens into the pharynx a portion of which is the common passage for food and air the pharynx opens through the larynx region into the trachea larynx is a cartilaginous box which helps in sound production and hence called the sound box. During swallowing, a glottis can be covered by a thin elastic cartilaginous flap called epiglottis to prevent the entry of food into the larynx. Trachea is a straight tube extending up to the mid thoracic cavity which divides at the level of fifth thoracic vertebrae into a right and left primary bronchi. Each bronchi undergoes repeated divisions to form the secondary and the tertiary bronchi and bronchioles, ending up in a very thin terminal bronchioles. The trachea, primary, secondary and the tertiary bronchi and initial bronchioles are supported by incomplete cartilaginous rings. Each terminal bronchiole gives rise to a number of very thin, irregular walled and vascularized bag-like structures called alveoli. The branching network of bronchi, bronchioles and alveoli comprise the lungs. We have two lungs which are covered by a double-layered pleura with pleural fluid between them. It reduces friction on the lung surface. The outer pleural membrane is in the close contact with the thoracic lining. 
whereas the inner pleural membrane is in contact with the lung surface let's just look at the diagram before going further here is epiglottis which is covering the glottis the opening of the trachea and then the larynx and there is trachea trachea is divided into two bronchi and then bronchi is further divided into bronchioles and all then the alveoli so there is pleural membranes and the ribs diaphragm and heart is labeled in this sectional view the part starting with the external nostrils up to the terminal bronchioles constitute the conducting part whereas the alveoli and their ducts form the respiratory or exchange part of the respiratory system the conducting part transports the atmospheric air to the alveoli clears it from foreign particles humidifies and also brings the air to body temperature exchange part is the site of actual diffusion of o2 and co2 between blood and atmospheric air the lungs are situated in the thoracic chamber which is anatomically an airtight chamber the thoracic chamber is formed dorsally by the vertebral column ventrally by the sternum laterally by the ribs and on the lower side by the dome shaped diaphragm the anatomical setup of the lungs in thorax is such that any change in the volume of the thoracic cavity will be reflected in the lung cavity such an arrangement is essential for breathing as we cannot directly alter the pulmonary volume respiration involves the following steps breathing or pulmonary ventilation by which atmospheric air is drawn in and co2 rich alveolar air is released out diffusion of gases o2 and co2 across alveolar membrane transport of gases by blood diffusion of o2 and co2 between blood and tissues utilization of o2 by cells for catabolic reactions and resultant release of co2 mechanisms of breathing breathing involves two stages inspiration during which atmospheric air is drawn in and expiration by which the alveolar air is released out the movement of air into and out of the lungs is carried out by creating a pressure gradient between the lungs and the atmosphere inspiration can occur if the pressure within the lungs intrapulmonary pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure that is there is a negative pressure in the lungs with respect to atmospheric pressure similarly expiration takes place when the intrapulmonary pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure the diaphragm and the specialized set of muscles external and internal intercostal between the ribs help in generation of such gradients inspiration is initiated by the contraction of diaphragm which increases the volume of thoracic chamber in the anterior posterior axis the contraction of external intercostal muscles lift up the ribs and the sternum causing an increase in the volume of thoracic chamber in the dorso ventral axis the overall increase in the thoracic volume causes a similar increase in the pulmonary volume an increase in pulmonary volume decreases the intrapulmonary pressure to less than the atmospheric pressure which forces the air from outside to move into the lungs that is inspiration relaxation of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles return the diaphragm and sternum to their normal position and reduce the thoracic volume thereby the pulmonary volume this leads to an increase in intrapulmonary pressure to slightly above the atmospheric pressure causing the expulsion of air from the lungs that is expiration we have the ability to increase the strength of the inspiration and expiration with the help of additional muscles in the abdomen on an average a healthy human breathes 12 to 16 times per minute 
the volume of air involved in the breathing movements can be estimated by using a spirometer which helps in clinical assessment of pulmonary functions let's have a look on the diagram first diagram is like volume of the thorax is increased the ribs and sternums are raised due to the contracted diaphragm and the contraction of the internal uh, intercostal muscles which indirectly decreases the intrapulmonary pressure and allows the atmospheric air to enter into the lungs which we call as inspiration so first diagram is related to the inspiration okay and the second diagram when the diaphragm is relaxed and arched upwards ribs and sternum return to the original positions due to the relaxation of the intercostal muscles and the volume of thorax is decreased and intrapulmonary pressure is increased so the internal air the air present in the lungs is expelled out from the lungs that what we call as expiration now let's look at the respiratory volumes and the capacity tidal volume or tv volume of air inspired or expired during a normal respiration it is approx 50 500 ml that is a healthy man can inspire or expire approximately 6000 to 8000 ml of air per minute inspiratory reserve volume irv additional volume of air a person can inspire by a forcible inspiration this averages 2500 ml to 3000 ml expiratory reserve volume additional volume of air a person can expire after a forcible expiration by a forcible expiration this averages 1000 ml to 1100 ml residual volume volume of air remaining in the lungs even after forcible expiration this averages 1100 ml to 1200 ml by adding up a few respiratory volumes described above one can derive various pulmonary capacities which can be used in clinical diagnosis inspiratory capacity total volume of air a person can inspire after a normal expiration this includes tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume expiratory capacity total volume of air a person can expire after a normal inspiration this includes tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume there is functional residual vol- capacity volume of air that will remain in the lungs after a normal expiration this includes ERV and RV vital capacity the maximum volume of air a person can breathe in after a forced expiration this includes ERV TV and IRV or the maximum volume of the air a person can breathe out after a forced inspiration total lung capacity TLC total volume of air accommodated in the lungs at the end of a forced inspiration this includes rv erv tv and irv or a vital capacity plus residual volume exchange of gases alveoli are primary sites of exchange of gases exchange of gases also occur between blood and tissues oxygen and co2 are exchanged in these sites by simple diffusion mainly based on pressure or concentration gradient solubility of the gases as well as the thickness of the membranes involved in diffusion are also some important factors that can affect the rate of diffusion pressure contributed by an individual gas in a mixture of a gases is called partial pressure and is represented as po2 for oxygen and pco2 for carbon dioxide partial pressures of these two gases in the atmospheric air and the two sites of diffusions are given in table 
and in figure 17.3. The data given in the table clearly indicates a concentration gradient for oxygen from alveoli to blood and blood to tissues. Similarly, a gradient is present for CO2 in the opposite direction that is from tissues to the blood and blood to the alveoli. Let's look at the table and the di diagram. Respiratory gases there is O2 and CO2. Atmospheric air may partial pressure of oxygen is 159 mm of Hg and partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is 104 mm of Hg in the deoxygenated blood it is 40 mm of Hg and in the oxygenated one is 95 mm of Hg tissues have 40 mm of Hg now respiratory gases we talk about the CO2 partial pressure of CO2 atmospheric air 0.3 mm of Hg alveoli 40 mm of Hg deoxygenated blood 45 mm of Hg blood oxygenated one is 40 mm of Hg tissues is 45 mm of Hg let's look at the diagram of diagrammatic representation of exchange of gases at the alveolus and the body tissues with blood and transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide in a way we can say that there are there is a pulmonary circulation and the systemic circulation pulmonary circulation is uh, like between lungs and the heart and systemic circulation is between heart and the body tissues okay so if you talk about the pulmonary circulation pulmonary artery contains deoxygenated blood and pulmonary vein contains oxygenated blood but unlike pulmonary circulation systemic circulation in systemic circulation the artery carry oxygenated blood and the vein carry deoxygenated blood although the pressure partial pressure of CO2 in O2 is already discussed so I would say you just pause the video and look at the diagram and memorize the labels that's it let's go further as the solubility of CO2 is 20 to 25 times higher than that of O2 the amount of a CO2 that can diffuse through diffusion membrane per unit difference in partial pressure is much higher compared to that of O2 the diffusion membrane is made up of three major layers namely the thin squamous epithelium of alveoli the endothelium of alveolar capillaries and the basement substance composed of thin basement membrane supporting the squamous epithelium and the basement membrane surrounding the single layer endothelial cells of capillaries in between them however its total thickness is much less than a millimeter therefore all the factors in our body are favorable for diffusion of O2 from alveoli to the tissues and that of CO2 from tissues to the alveoli. Here's a diagram of a section of an alveolus with a pulmonary capillary. There is squamous epithelium and endothelium of the blood capillary and between them there is basement substance. So this, these are the three layers of the diffusion membrane alveolar layer the squamous epithelial layer of the alveoli basement membrane and the endothelium of blood capillary now transport of gases blood is the medium of transport for o2 and co2 about 97 percent of the o2 is transported by rbc's in the blood the remaining three percent of o2 is carried out in a dissolved state through the plasma nearly 20 to 25 percent of co2 is transported by rbc's whereas 70 percent of it is carried as bicarbonate and 
about 7% of CO2 is carried in a dissolved state through plasma. Transport Oxygen Hemoglobin is a red colored iron containing pigment present in the RBCs. O2 can bind with hemoglobin in a reversible manner to form oxyhemoglobin. Each hemoglobin molecule can carry a maximum of 4 molecules of O2. Binding of oxygen with hemoglobin is primarily related to partial pressure of oxygen. Partial pressure of CO2, hydrogen ion and concentration and temperature are the other factors which can interfere with this binding. A sigmoid curve is obtained when percentage saturation of hemoglobin with O2 is plotted against the partial pressure of O2. This curve is called the oxygen dissociation curve and is highly useful in studying the effect of factors like partial pressure of CO2, hydrogen concentration etc. on the binding of O2 with hemoglobin. In alveoli where there is high partial pressure of oxygen, low partial pressure of CO2, lesser H plus concentration and low temperature the factors are all favorable for the formation of oxyhemoglobin whereas in the tissues where low partial pressure of oxygen high partial pressure of co2 high h plus concentration and higher temperature exist the conditions are favorable for dissociation of oxygen from the oxyhemoglobin this clearly indicates that O2 gets bound to hemoglobin in the lung surface and gets dissociated at the tissues. Every 100 ml of oxygenated blood can deliver around 5 ml of O2 to the tissues under normal, condi normal physiological conditions. Now transport of carbon dioxide. CO2 is carried by hemoglobin as carbaminohemoglobin about 20 to 25 percent this binding is related to partial pressure of co2 partial pressure of o2 is a major factor which could affect this binding remember partial pressure of o2 is a major factor which could affect the binding of co2 with the hemoglobin when partial pressure of CO2 is high and partial pressure of oxygen is low, as in the tissues, more binding of carbon dioxide occurs, whereas the partial pressure is partial pressure of CO2 is low and partial pressure of oxygen is high, as in alveoli, dissociation of CO2 from carbaminohemoglobin takes place. That is, CO2 which is bound to hemoglobin from the tissues is delivered at the alveoli. RBCs contain a very high concentration of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase and minute quantities of same is present in the plasma too. This enzyme facilitates the following reactions in the both directions. CO2 plus H2O is added and forms H2CO3 with the help of carbonic anhydrase and this could be a irreversible form also and then H2CO3 is forming HCO3 minus plus H plus with the help of carbonic anhydrase again and again this could be a irreversible reaction at the tissue site where partial pressure of CO2 is high due to catabolism CO2 diffuses into blood, RBCs and plasma and forms HCO3 minus and H plus. At the alveolar site, whereas PCO2 is low, the reaction proceeds in the opposite direction, leading to the formation of CO2 and H2O. Thus, CO2 trapped as bicarbonate at the tissue level and transported to the alveoli is released out at as CO2. Every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood delivers approximately 4 ml of CO2 to the alveoli. Regulation of respiration. 
human beings have a significant ability to maintain and moderate the respiratory rhythm to suit the demands of the body tissues this is done by the neural system a specialized center present in the medulla region of the brain called a respiratory rhythm center is primarily responsible for this regulation another center present in the pons region of the brain called pneumotaxic center can moderate the functions of respiratory rhythm center neural signal from this center can reduce the duration of inspiration and thereby alter the respiratory rate a chemosensitive area is situated adjacent to the rhythm center which is highly sensitive to co2 and hydrogen ions increase in these substances can activate the center which in turn can signal the rhythm center to make necessary adjustments in the respiratory processes by which these substances can be eliminated receptors associated with the aortic arc and the carotid artery also can recognize changes in the co2 and h plus concentration and send necessary signals to the rhythm center for remedial actions the role of oxygen in the regulation of respiratory rhythm is quite insignificant disorders of respiratory system asthma is a difficulty in breathing causing wheezing due to inflammation of bronchi and bronchioles emphysema is a chronic disorder in which alveolar walls are damaged due to which respiratory surface is decreased one of the major causes of the of this is cigarette smoking occupational respiratory disorders in certain industries especially those involving grinding or stone breaking so much dust is produced that the defense mechanism of the body cannot fully cope with the situation long exposure can give rise to inflammation leading to fibrosis or proliferation of fibrous tissues and thus causing serious lung damage workers in such industries should wear protective mask summary cells utilize oxygen for metabolism and produce energy along with substances like carbon dioxide which is harmful animals have evolved different mechanisms for the transport of oxygen to the cells and for the removal of carbon dioxide from there we have a well developed respiratory system comprising two lungs and associated air passages to perform this function the first step in the respiration is breathing by which atmospheric air is taken in or inspiration and the alveolar air is released out expiration exchange of o2 and co2 between deoxygenated blood and alveoli transport of these gases throughout the body by blood exchange of o2 and co2 between the oxygenated blood and the tissues and utilization of o2 by the cells or cellular respiration are the other steps involved inspiration and expiration are carried out by the creating pressure gradients between the atmosphere and the alveoli with the help of specialized muscles intercostals and diaphragm volumes of air involved in these activities can be estimated with the help of spirometer and are of clinical significance exchange of o2 and co2 at the alveoli and the tissues occur by diffusion rate of diffusion is dependent on the partial pressure gradients of o2 or po2 and co2 that is partial pressure of co2 their solubility as well as the thickness of the diffusion surface these factors in the in our body facilitate diffusion of o2 from the alveoli to the deoxygenated blood as well as from the oxygenated blood to the tissues the factors are favorable for the diffusion of co2 in the opposite direction that is from tissues to alveoli oxygen is transported mainly as oxyhemoglobin 
in the alveoli where PO2 is higher, O2 gets bound to the hemoglobin, which is easily dissociated at the tissues, where PO2 is low and PCO2 and Xless concentration are high. Nearly 70% of carbon dioxide is transported at a bicarbonate with the help of enzyme carbonic anhydrase. 20 to 25 percent of carbon dioxide is carried by hemoglobin as carbamino hemoglobin. In the tissues where PCO2 is high, it gets bound to blood, whereas in the alveoli where PCO2 is low and PO2 is high, it gets removed from the blood. Respiratory rhythm is maintained by the respiratory center in the medulla region of brain. A pneumotaxic center in the pons region of the brain and the chemosensitive area in the medulla can alter respiratory mechanism. Here our chapter ends. So please if you like this video and if these videos really help you to increase the memory folds so please like and subscribe this channel and soon i guess we will be providing the short notes of the biology and some extra points on every single chapter so please do subscribe and turn on the notification bell so that you could get notified whenever i put new videos thank you